Howdy folks of Greys of Westminster and of course everywhere else around the world tuning in. I've got some marvelous questions, six of them, kind of tough ones. Let me see if I can give you some answers that might help you, uh, one, with your own photography and two, understand a little bit more about myself and the goals I've had and do have for my photography. To boil it all down to a nutshell, I feel incredibly fortunate to be able to go out to so many places, places of my own choosing for the most part, that I want to go and explore. I'm a real curious person. I love history, be it biological or uh, history as far as the way the world has unfolded. And going out with my camera to see what I can find and then bring back those answers is probably the biggest motivation. Next motivation is then to, to help others. And here's why. Long ago, when my wife Sharon and I started this, this whole thing off, back in, in 1980, we realized that the two of us alone and my camera weren't going to solve some of the problems we were seeing when it comes to our environment. We need a whole lot more folks involved, passionately involved like we are. And we really thought that if we could enlist an army of photographers to go out and see the many places we're not able to see, bring back those stories and share them with others, we could affect a difference in the world for ourselves and for future generations. So that's also kind of part of the motivation. Uh, lastly, uh, I love telling stories. It's, it's just that simple. I tell stories on all sorts of different fronts and different topics, whether I've photographed them or not. And it's just the way that uh, the environment I was brought up in, the way I love to share the world. So all that together kind of motivates me and my camera as I travel about telling stories. I really don't like to harp on the bad. There's enough of that out there, what used to be way back in the day called black environmentalism. So I always like to look at the good stuff. Now shocking would imply that something was happening that I wasn't ready for. And there's not been much of that. I do a lot of homework, so I don't get shocked, but I do get surprised. Uh, nature every day loves to surprise me in, in many different ways. Stories, God, I have lots of them about this. One of my favorites that people like to hear is long ago when I was up in Alaska, up in coastal Alaska, on a cook inlet. I was working with grizzly bears, something I just love to do. They're just an amazing critter, very uh, much misunderstood. Urban legends and myths make them out as big man-eaters, and I found them to be quite the opposite. One of my favorite stories is I was out working with a female and three cubs, and the female was probably 20, 30 feet away, not untypical, busy eating grass, which they do. They're like cattle. They just munch away. And one of her cubs, one of the ones that was kind of the troublemaker of the three, uh, later on that week is the one that dug up a, a beehive in the ground, got stung in the, in the tongue. Well, that particular cub wandered over to me. Now, I'm sure you've heard all the lessons about not getting between a cub and hurts mom. And that's a very valid thing. You just don't want to do that. And in this case, I wasn't between them, but the cub came over literally in between my tripod legs. And I had a, a brand new uh, carbon fiber tripod and it started to, to, to mouth it. And there's a slight static charge, which I assume it kind of enjoyed. And it was just like, ah, you know, gnawing on it. And mom was just 30 feet away. Now, grizzly bears, when they get startled or surprised, whatever it is that startled or surprised them, they just run them over. I mean, flatten them. Then they might turn around and look and say, oh, I flattened or ran over, blah, blah, blah. And if it still looks aggressive, they, they just go munch on it. Well, us humans, we don't do well after being ran over. So I just kind of quietly clap my hands, trying to get that cub to slowly move away because I didn't know if at any moment it would make a sound that would mean anything to me, but to mom, she'd look up and go, hmm, and run over me. And I didn't want that. 
So that's just one of many different uh, stories that I've been incredibly fortunate to witness as a photographer. That's a really great question. And the answers are probably not what you might expect. The first thing is you've got to be really passionate about what you do. You have to not be looking for fame and fortune because that's not what comes. Not in the monetary sense that you might think that, you know, is really important to a lot of folks. That's never really been top of my list. Success for myself is the fact that 40 years later, I'm still in front of the camera and mostly behind the camera telling my story. And the fact that it's still relevant, people want to hear what I have to say, you know, that kind of underlines what I think makes a successful photographer. Are you successful every time you go out shooting every day, every week, every year? It doesn't work that way. And that's part of being successful. You have to understand the ups and the downs. There are going to be valleys and peaks. There's, it's just the nature of the beast. You have to be a good business person. And a business person doesn't mean you know how to sell photos. It means you know how to control the dollar and where it comes and goes and, and expect and see the rides and, and weather out the storms. That all goes under that umbrella of successful photographer. So there isn't just any one thing, there's a lot. And all of that is combined, and I can't say enough, with the fact that you have a passion for what you're doing and you have a lot of fun. Fun is essential, there's no way around it. Well, first and foremost, how would my life be different? It would be dramatically different in some ways. Uh, I was raised in a family of creatives, and they all had different mediums in which they liked to express their creativity. My father was very much a woodworker, and I grew up in a wood shop. And I still have a wood shop and do a lot of working woodworking to this day. Probably that would have been what I would have fallen into, maybe, if uh, wildlife and aviation had come so strong. Now, the whole wildlife photography thing, it wasn't like it was planned. It was just part of life that unfolded for me. I was very fortunate. And while a lot of doors got closed, enough windows were left open far enough that I could keep moving forward. And that's really kind of the important part of this, you know, my message. You just have to keep moving that ball forward and keep working hard and, and things work out. Now, the whole riding thing, to be honest with you, uh, that's kind of hilarious. When I started out, and this will seem kind of archaic, but how it was back in the day, uh, you didn't uh, submit photographs and text from the same person. Photographers didn't do that. It wasn't accepted. You had to have a separate writer for the article to go with the photographs. So in the very beginning, uh, and most of the editors I work with now know this, but back in the beginning, you'd see photographs by B. Moose Peterson and X text or article by Sharon Peters, my wife. When in reality, I writ wrote all of it. It was, it was all me. Now, I do really thank you for your description of my writing, but you got to understand some of me in writing. It's a love-hate relationship. I love expressing myself, but with a camera and my photographs, much more than writing, but writing's a vehicle to help sell those photographs. Kind of go hand in hand. So I don't really give writing uh, the institution, the grammar, the respect it deserves, or I should put my time into to express myself that way. I have uh, been very blessed with a, a beautiful bride who's very good with that stuff and who knows me all too well and can take all my and transform it into what you see and read today. So, um, yeah, if I did uh, have a camera, you would not see my written word. The photographic community was not kind, which I, I'm sad to say is not too untypical. You um, 
the photographic community, like a lot of them, is very quick to, uh, to uh, as my good friend would say, shoot arrows in the backs of the pioneers. With that said, uh, on the flip side, kind of going back to one of the other questions, the business side of photography, you know, or back in the day, you would send your slide, your 35 millimeter or larger chrome to the publisher. They would have to take it out of the mount and then they would put it on a, uh, an oil drum, it'd spin, they'd scan it and make separations, how you, you printed magazines and books. In that process, process, quite often, that original got damaged and a chrome is a chrome. Once it's gone or damaged, there is no duplicates like you have in the digital age. So one of the first things Sharon and I did when we started reaching out to publications with our digital files was point out the fact that in the delivery memo, which is not existed anymore, that that first clause that if you damage a slide, it was gonna cost you $1,500, that all disappeared because it's a digital file. You can make original copies all day long. And that made us and engraced us with so many publishers that there's no way I was going back to conventional. They all wanted it. And for a long time, that got me out there. And I think that along with the fact that, you know, I was a heretic for, you know, killing film, didn't endear me a lot with the photographic community. That's just the way the world, you just keep moving the ball forward. Uh, in some ways, yeah, let's be honest, people, no matter what they do, don't really often embrace change. Because change means the unknown, and sometimes with the unknown comes the fear that you might not succeed. And, and we are, as a society, very much paranoid and frozen by the fact that we might fail. Where, you know, be honest with you, when it comes to photography, I embrace failure as much as success. Because from failure is where I tend to make my greatest leaps and knowledge and learning than from success. So yeah, there are parallels there. Got to be honest with you though, it doesn't really get to me. Yeah, there's some, you know, the stuff that comes out that on the social networks that's like, it, it's, I shake my head and I have to shake it off. But, you know, um, life has been very good to me and photography even better. So you just have to take that with us being part of the territory. I don't have any one answer why you should. I think you'll find though that one thing I do with everything I put out there, I'm trying to, to thank you for your time that you're spending with me. There's something in everything I have to put out there that's gonna help you as a photographer move forward and in some ways help you as a person get through and navigate this crazy world. I come to all this with an attitude of great gratitude and the good fortune I've had as a photographer. I'm coming into you right now from our ranch here in Montana. And all of this is because of the, the skill and the passion and the love I put in behind the camera. It's something that you all can do. And I think that's the message for my work that I want everybody to take away. And if, if you don't take the moment to, to just take that in, Look at my photographs with Kodiak Browns or with Warbirds or with World War II veterans or with incredible landscapes that I am so incredibly fortunate to visit and spend time in. There's part of this world you probably are going to miss out on and this world is really big and grand and, and we should all take it all in. If nothing else, so we can preserve what we have been left for future generations. So that's probably the biggest message I have in my photography and in my work. Appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you. Hope this helps. Remember to make every click your story.